to verify. I am sharing the correct screen, right? You got it. All right, yep. perfect. So talking all about access points, uh, we're not going to go into too much detail with anything. Most of these topics that I'm going to cover can probably be their entire own webinar session. So instead of spending 40 minutes or so talking about one small feature, uh, just kind of a glossing over all the different potential features or capabilities of an access point specifically. And to kind of start it off, um, in my opinion, and I, and I think a lot of people will agree with this too, is that you kind of have to start from a design standpoint. So knowing what, what clients you're serving in terms of your um, access point is very important, especially to know which features of an AP are important for your environments in, in particular. And it's always that most important but least capable device is always the, the one that's either the trickiest to, to design for or the one that you need to kind of set those baseline requirements to then know what uh, what features to look for, what um, what capabilities of the AP specifically. Uh, that way you're not buying something or buying a bunch of hardware that, it, that doesn't even support that old client that you have. Let's say you have an, a scanner in, um, in a warehouse that's still on like 802.11b, so it's an old legacy client will uh, potentially have some issues with with newer access points, with newer features, if that's kind of what you're designing your network for. Um, and as we know, most of the users these days have more than one device. So you're, you have a, um, in an office environment, you can have one user with three, four devices connected at a time. So really preparing for that um, capacity requirement for the, number of clients and kind of what those clients are capable of as well is, is important to know. So you, you need to know not only the FI uh, that's supported for your APs, but also your client as well. Number of spatial streams that the client has. And then as, as we kind of get into the, um, the capabilities of an access point, how those, um, how those work with the specific clients as well and how they work together is very important to know. And then whenever you're actually looking at the access point specifically, um, a lot of the times it's difficult to know just based off of um, looking at an AP or looking at a press release, for example. Um, a lot of it is just marketing spiel. It's just terminology that they're using to uh, hype up the latest technology saying, hey, look at this fancy new AP that we've worked so hard to, to design, it makes sense. And look at these theoretical best case scenario throughput numbers that we're getting uh, that you're never gonna actually see in the real world. Um, so so like with Wi-Fi 6, I think max theoretical speed is what, 10 gigabits per second. So you're, you're not really going to see that on a client. Uh, uh, and kind of being able to look at a data sheet for an AP, no, Kind of what features to look for is kind of important because I, I don't know if you guys have looked at data sheets for APs, but they can be overwhelming. You're looking at a huge chart of information with uh, technical jargon that half of it you probably don't even care about for the most part, or you're looking at FCC documentation um, that they have to have to produce. So it's, it's a, uh, it's hard to kind of look through all of the information and pick out what's important to you uh, without knowing um, kind of beforehand what those devices that you're supporting actually are. So that's why that most important, least capable client is uh, very important to know. And then once you figure that out, you also have to think about configuration for the access point. So. Um, if it's a small environment, you can maybe get away with configuring each AP individually with standalone APs. Um, but as you're rolling out to more complex or larger deployments, you're really going to want to look at um, configuring all of these in a central, in a centralized way. So using a controller. But then you have 
on-premise controller versus cloud managed controller. Um, so not not all of the access points support uh, both options. So that kind of changes feature feature wise um, options that you have. And if we dig into that a little bit, again, this is one of those topics that we could spend an entire webinar on. Um, the differences between an on-premise uh, WA controller versus a cloud managed controller. Uh, I'm sure people have very strong opinions one way or the other. Um, most of my experience is on-premise. So um, you already have a LAN architecture in place. You, um, you can um, kind of add in a wireless controller or just upgrade an existing wireless controller that you may already have. So it kind of eases that uh, in terms of deployment. For on-premise, you don't have to have an internet connectivity either. So with most cloud managed providers, you're gonna need an uplink to the cloud. You're gonna need an internet link to bring all of your access points online. Um, and another feature as well is, is there's some added complexibility that you can you can configure within an on-premise controller. So you have, you kind of have more options under the hood. You can uh, more, more finely tune your, your um, RF environment typically uh, with an on-premise controller. And, and a lot of this is changing too. So cloud manage is getting more um, capable as well, but it's still relatively new compared to the on-premise controllers that, that have been kind of around for, for years at this point. Uh, but with cloud manage, you add some other um, uh, some other benefits. So it's it's much more flexible. You can just deploy access points, plug them in. They'll connect over the internet to the to the cloud managed uh, controller. Makes setup pretty easy. Um, a lot of them have kind of zero touch deployments, is what they call it. So as soon as you plug it in, it's it's connecting to your your dashboard, and then broadcasting out the networks that you have configured. Uh, and so forth. And it, it helps for scalability as well. So if you have uh, deployments across the globe, you still have one centralized um, management um, kind of option there within your your dashboard. Um, and then maintenance as well. So the uh, one thing you'll, you'll need to think about as well is uh, software upgrades. So as new features are rolled out or bug fixes, if uh, if, if, if there's an issue with the software, um, that's all done by the service provider. So they'll upload the the um, software to your dashboard for you instead of having to, to deploy that software and schedule downtime for your controller and um, all that kind of fun networking um, uh, kind of maintenance and after hours work that kind of goes into it as well. So. And then once you figure out kind of what um, configuration options you want, so whether it's um, you manage all of the hardware or it's all in the cloud, you can then think about the um, the access points themselves. So um, uh, back in the day, there used to be just single band APs. Now there's dual band is, is most is is before was the most common. Now it's probably tri band is the most common these days. Um, and that's just like, just the, how many radios are in the AP. So you have with dual band two different radios. Typically it's a it's a dedicated 2.4 and a five gigahertz radio. Um, the three band so you can have either say a 2.4 radio and then two different five gig radios. Those are really nice for like mesh APs. So you have an entirely separate five gig um, radio. So it's an entirely different channel for like your backhaul, for example. Uh, but with uh, 6E coming, so we, we're in, in, uh, introducing the six gigahertz spectrum as well. So that's adding another radio, adding another band to, to the, the, the equation here. So we're now even seeing quad band APs. Um, and these are great for mesh APs in particular, in my opinion. So you have client serving radios on 2.4, 5 gig and six, and then you have a five gig band that you can actually use for 
say a mesh backhaul, for example, or two separate five gig bands for uh, an additional client. So if you have um, excessive capacity or, or a large number of clients that you're supporting, you have the um, capability with the AP or with the air airspace that it provides and the frequency allocations for the channels to support all of those devices. And then here's just a chart to kind of show you what's what uh, Wi-Fi FIs are typically supported. So we're up to 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 um, and kind of some info related to those. So with AC, Wi-Fi 5 is when 80 and 160 megahertz wide channels um, became supported. The, it also increased the um, supported spatial streams up from four up to eight. Um, that is another um, very important um, feature of an access point that you want to look into, especially now that Wi-Fi 6 is supporting that multi-user uh, MIMO. And we'll get into that, what that is in the next slide as well. But um, Still, most of the clients that we're seeing these days are two by two devices. So they have two transmit um, antennas and two uh, receive antennas. So whenever you're using, uh, when you're using MIMO specifically, uh, with single user, it's using uh, the APs communicating with a client, um, just that one client at a time. So the maximum number of spatial streams for your client, um, the, the quicker you can serve that client, the quicker it can get its data sent across. Uh, so the next user has the ability to, to communicate over, over the air. Um, but when with multi-user MIMO, um, we can use beamforming as well to then, instead of one device at a time, as long as the AP has spatial streams available, it can then communicate with other clients as well. So if you have, say, for example, an eight by eight um, access point, you could then serve four different two by two clients at the same time. Um, so it, 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 it allows for um, kind of serving those clients quicker and quicker uh, uh, to prevent slowness or to just improve the Wi-Fi experience for your end users as well, just to get them onto the network quicker and send send their data. And then specifically some some options for APs, kind of what you can get. So here um, this picture is showing you uh, the inside of a outdoor AP with uh, it, it's a two by two access point. Um, but but do you even need an eight by eight AP, for example? Do you need that that um, that number? What are your? Uh, this is where it comes into. It, it's very beneficial to know what devices you're actually supporting in your environment. Um, if you have just a bunch of one by one devices, do you really need to spend that extra money for that eight by eight um, spatial stream AP? Um, kind of all of these things kind of come back into the design phase and, and making sure that you're supporting devices that are actually being used on your network as opposed to just implementing the latest features and everything else. Because with more antennas, it requires more power to, to be supplied to the access point. And then you have to think about how you're powering devices. Um, is it PoE? What are the differences in terms of PoE? And we'll talk about that later on as well. So. It's just a lot of a lot of factors come into play, and it makes and, and uh, making sure that you're aware of the devices that are being used in your environment helps make these decisions. And knowing uh, the capabilities of the AP kind of um, easier to digest um, and and uh, allows you to kind of make informed decisions before you start spending thousands of dollars to roll out. Um, a, a new Wi-Fi wi environment or refreshing hardware, that type of thing. And then in terms of different 
ways an access point can be used. So there's different operating modes for the APs. Um, the two main ones are either uh, can, can kind of be broken up into access points that are actively serving clients. So your your clients are connecting to to the network, um, being able to access uh, network um, resources, that kind of thing. Uh, they can be locally switched. So like my most of my experience is from the Cisco side of things. So Cisco would call that Flex Connect um, to, to where the the um, the wireless client is authenticating and the management frames are being sent to the controller, but then the um, the actual data that's being sent is then routed locally um, to that environment. So so it's kind of VLAN off. Um, is one way you can kind of put it, or centrally switched where all of the traffic is then being routed back or tunneled back to to a controller. Uh, you can also be in type of in, in a bridged mode. Um, I believe Aruba uh, kind of calls their locally switched feature in, I think they call that bridge mode, if I remember correctly. Uh, bridge mode can also just mean um, a mesh environment or a like, like a work group bridge to where you're just extending LAN across. So you can have say a root bridge and a, and um, uh, uh, kind of extending out or connecting with other bridges to, to just extend out your LAN, that type of thing. Um, but there's also, you can do network management with specific APs. So some, some vendors, you can change the access point to where it's not serving clients anymore, but the AP is now either operating in like a sniffer mode to where it's just capturing data. So you can then save it into a PCAP file and, and look through the, the data itself. Uh, you can change the AP into say a spectrum analyzer to where you're actually viewing what's happening um, in the air. So you can kind of graph out the spectrum as, um, in real time, uh, you can put it in a monitor mode to where the AP is just, um, it, it's performing an IDS function. So uh, WIPs, for example, or all, all it's doing is detecting rogue AP. So there, there's, there's options that you have for a lot of these access points that are, that are being um, uh, made these days to, to give you more options than just serving clients. So you can use these APs to do other things as well. And then one thing as well that we you want to talk about whenever um, thinking about access points specifically, a number of SSIDs that are supported. Typically you'll see um, a max number of say eight uh, up to 16. Um, I think some APs, you can even go further than 16. Uh, but typically you just see eight to 16. Um, and, and I think it was my grandmother that always told me when I was younger, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, just because you can configure 16 SSIDs doesn't mean you really should. Uh, with each SSID, you're going to inc uh, add overhead to the network. Um, so uh, again, this this is another topic that we could probably spend an entire webinar on. It's just about uh, SSIDs uh, and and how they impact your wireless. Uh, so uh, um, typically, um, an AP is configured by default to send out a beacon every hundred or so milliseconds. It's 102.4. Um, so that that means that each SSID that you have configured will be sending out a beacon every 100 milliseconds. So that's that's using the air every 100 milliseconds before any clients even come into your environment. Um, and let's say you have a dual band or even a quad band these days, uh, and, and you're broadcasting five SSIDs. So a dual band, that would be 10 beacons that are being sent out by that AP every 102 milliseconds. Um, and another thing to note as well is that their uh, beacons are sent out at the lowest mandatory data rate. So if you if you do have to support those legacy 802.11b uh, clients, um, those beacons are being sent out at one megabit per second 
two megabit per second, what, whatever you have set as your lowest mandatory data rate. Um, so that's going to slow down the rest of your clients um, just from those beacon traffic. Um, this will directly impact the client experience and um, you, you could have a significant overhead just from adding a new SSID. Um, so it's kind of limiting that number to the lowest possibles is, is, a, is a good good starting point. And I definitely would not recommend ever, if you can, ever going over, say, five. Three typically is, is kind of the, the, um, the sweet spot that, that I would like to be in, in terms of maximum. Uh, and then just kind of quickly, some, some cover, some guest access. Um, so this ranges quite drastically in terms of setup. It can be very simple in terms of um, setting up just a, a, another SSID that's completely um, segmented away from your regular network to where your the, the the users are kind of isolated on their own. Um, they can be done just just putting them on a separate VLAN that doesn't have access to, to the rest of the network resources. Um, you can do uh, wireless client isolation. That way the, the clients, when they're connected, they, they can't actually uh, send traffic to other wireless clients connected to the same SSID. Um, those are not too difficult to configure. Um, I know Jim has done a webinar specifically with Captive Portal, and I think that he may have the same opinion about Captive Portal that I do. Uh, just avoid it at all costs if you can. Uh, it's kind of an unnecessary, unnecessary complex uh, kind of configuration to be added to um, to your environment. I, I don't know if you have anything specific yeah. you'd like to add to that, but well, I could just really go on a long rant but <clears throat> my advice is is exhaust all other alternatives to to getting those terms of service in front of your users those aups in front of your users before you decide the captive portal on wi-fi is the the best way to do it yeah and in some some instances you're not going to be able to avoid it unfortunately but just just Making sure that you're aware of it is, is kind of uh, a good, good good thing to do here. And like I said, I, I'm i fairly certain earlier this year, you did an entire webinar just about captive portals. I did. So a lot of these is, uh, these topics we're talking about today are very, very high level. Just, yes, that's an option, basically. So, And then in terms of security features, again, this is... This is a topic that uh, each each version of WPA could be its own topic. I, kn I know uh, Thomas earlier this year had a webinar just about WPA3. So we, we can go into very much or, or very more detail with all of these. But these are some, some features that um, some APs typically you'll see. So uh, they'll support WPA, WPA2, WPA3. Um, personal versus enterprise, the differences between those pre-shared keys versus more of like an EAP authentication. So with EAP, you can either do, um, uh, say, authentication with certificates. So you have a certificate on the device that then is being used to authenticate against um, um, an external server to verify that the, that, that is a, a client that's allowed to connect um, uh, you, you could use it with like LDAP integration and username, password, that kind of thing as well. Um, typically, you'll see to where um, APs or wireless controllers specifically have kind of an internal firewall that they have. So you can add uh, ACLs or access control lists that can then limit um, traffic that your clients um, have allowed, and that's done on the AP or done on the controller itself. Um, and then Mac filtering. So this is simply just 
updating a database of allowed MAC addresses. And if your device does not have one of those MAC addresses, you would then not be able to authenticate to the uh, wireless controller. This is um, probably something I wouldn't recommend unless it was really required, especially now with a lot of mobile devices these days or just devices in general using um, randomized MAC addresses to where every time they connect to a Wi-Fi um, environment, they're using a different MAC address. Um, Role-based access control. So this is useful for um, configuration in terms of who is allowed to configure what on the AP or on the controller itself. Um, and then I talked about it a little bit previously in terms of WIPs or wireless intrusion prevention system. So this is just using uh, metrics or looking for signatures that have been defined as potential wireless attacks. Again, every single one of these features could, we could have an entire webinar about each one. So uh, don't really have the time this morning to go into each individual feature that we're talking about today, unfortunately. And then kind of rounding it out, uh, once you kind of know what features you want, now it's, it's important to know, well, do you even have the capability to power these devices? Um, so, so in terms of PoE, most of the APs these days require um, PoE plus or 802.11 or 802.3 AT. So that caps out at, at um, 30 watts. But um, the, these new APs that are using eight by eight um, uh, radios, they're they're requiring more than 30 watts. So whenever you're thinking about those new access points look at your switches. Do you have the power budget in your switches to actually power all these devices? Um, a lot of these access points you can power at PoE Plus that require PoE Plus um, Plus, but they will disable some features. Um, I think Cisco and Aruba have some APs that in order to use all of the features, um, it requires the PoE++, plus plus, but if you power it with PoE+, plus, it disables some things. So, so it disables, um, say, like the USB port that's on the switch itself, or it changes the 8x8 radio to where it now is functioning as a 4x4 radio. So those are some important um, important things to look for is, is how much power do these APs actually require? and then verify that you have the the um, the capability on your um, wired side infrastructure to actually power these devices. So, and then if there's any questions, all right, get to those. Thanks so much, Jack. We had some good chat and some good Q and A come in uh, during the uh, during the presentation. Um, and I just want to invite anybody out there, if you have a question, uh, to drop it in the Q&A panel and we'll get to it. A couple good questions from Nick. Uh, he asked a question early on, uh, Jack, about um, how to migrate from an on-premise WLAN architecture to a cloud-based architecture while switching vendors and also with the understanding that both systems are kind of live side by side for a couple of years during the the transition. Any uh, any pointers there? Um, it's not something I've actually done. Uh, one thing I would note for that is um, some things to keep in mind is as you're moving from one vendor to another in one cloud or on-prem to cloud-based. Uh, you may have some issues in terms of clients roaming from one to the other. That's the biggest thing that I can think of to kind of keep in mind because because they're completely separate infrastructures, so they're not connected in that point, and you will have kind of a hard roam to where they'll lose connection as they're moving from your on-prem to your cloud-based, for example. Anything yeah. that you can add to that, Jim? Yeah, I think that's a major concern. And and I think the best thing to do is 
kind of go one building at a time if you can, you know, so that they're consistent within the the RF uh, footprint, if you will, of that building with with just one system or the other as you migrate. Hopefully, there's uh, an opportunity there to kind of break things up. But if you inter intermix the two systems, like Jack mentioned, roaming's going to be pretty ugly. You're going to have um, you're not going to be able to do fast transition, and clients will have to reassociate. So keep that in mind. Another question from Nick, um, and he's you know we, we've talked about how uh, many APs have extra radios. So he says, is it better to assign um, a, a radio within an AP? I guess an excess radio to monitoring and management, or is it better better to dedicate the whole AP to monitoring or management to avoid interference from the client serving radios within the AP? Um, that's a good question, actually. Yeah. I don't think that I've done too much research in, um, say have one, let's say you have an AP with two five gig radios. If you have one that's serving clients and one that's that's doing some type of monitoring or management, how does the um, client serving radio impact the management portion, for example? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, and it's probably something you need to ask your AP vendor about, you know, how they handle that problem. I'd say in general though, you know, the designs that I've done where you have that capability, I kind of design for, you know, client serving coverage. And then you have a bunch of leftover radios from disabling excess of 2.4 gigahertz radios. And just to use those radios for something, throw them into, you know, monitor mode, for example. But sometimes if you're doing like RTLS or you have a really serious whips use case you might take a whole ap and and put it in that monitor or security yeah. mode i uh but i wouldn't be too concerned about using that access radio for a secondary purpose it might experience some interference but you know you have to think about how critical it is to the wi-fi network and say oh well we can live with that Okay, so Chad has an interesting question. If, if money or power wasn't an issue, money and power, would you just choose an eight by eight, eight spatial stream uh, radio rather than something lower? Um, <laughs> interesting I think it depends. I think yeah. it depends. So from my experience, so uh, I, I come from uh, kind of an enterprise background. Uh, so my experience mostly was like Cisco APs. Um, the last, the latest one that I had personal experience working with was uh, I think their 9130 model. So that one in particular has, it has an eight by eight radio in it. Uh, but you can also make that eight by eight radio into two separate logical four by four radios. So there are moments to where I would rather have the two four by four radios as opposed to the one eight by eight. But if I had a, a hypothetical situation to where I had multiple eight by eight radios, yeah, I would want the the more the more antennas, the better, in my opinion. But it kind of depends on how many devices you you're supporting and how um, what what capacity you need to design for anything to add on that jim well just an interesting question if if money or power wasn't an issue because it's always an issue with you know the if you want to go to eight radio chains um like that but um yes i i think actually there are significant advantages to using um, eight spatial streams in terms of uh, rate at range and um, you know ex extra receive change 
for increasing the receive sensitivity. Um, so if it's uh, if I could have eight spatial streams in all three bands, and oh, yeah. uh, didn't have to pay anything or or you know <laughs> run mains power to the AP to make it work, then I would do it. Uh. Uh, just maybe quickly, we can get through these last two. Question from Andrew. If supported by my devices, should I migrate to WPA3? Is it really that much more secure? Any caveats? It's been pretty slow to see adoption of WPA3 in the enterprise. But what do you think, Jack? Um, I mean, if, if your devices are supporting it, I would definitely say migrate to WPA3. Uh, I'm not as familiar with WPA3. So I can't really tell you how much more secure it is or kind of some caveats to look forward to. I haven't really done a full WPA3 deployment. So it's kind of hard to, to, to answer that question from my own personal experience. I don't know, Jim, if you have any info that you could kind of share with that in particular. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Uh... I think WPA2 still meets the security requirements in most enterprises. Uh, WPA3 supports uh, better encryption schemes and is a bit more hardened. So um, at eventually, yes, WPA3, I think, should, should become our default, but there isn't a lot of motivation right now to, to do it. And I think uh, one caveat that I've I've heard of, I haven't experienced myself, maybe people in the chat can talk about this, is some of the proprietary solutions that allow creating multiple PSKs on one SSID, like I think it's DPSK for Ruckus and IPSK for Cisco, and there's some other things. I don't think those work with WPA3. Um, if I'm wrong about that, let let us know in the chat. Steve makes a good point, though. WPA3 is required for 6 gigahertz. So if uh, think about where that is in your, in your planning and, uh, and have a plan to adopt WPA3 at least in the 6 gigahertz band uh, at that time. Last question from Josh. Can an AP conduct sufficient monitoring if it's only doing it part-time? So, and I would say, uh, you know, a lot hangs on that word sufficient. Yep. An AP, even if it's only doing it part-time or if it's doing it full-time, you know, it's only got two radios potentially. So it can only monitor two channels at a, at a time. It can't monitor every channel. It's still cycling through channels and only listening part-time on each channel. So. And if you have, let's say an intermittent issue, if it doesn't, if it's not monitoring when that issue is actually occurring, then yeah. does that meet your, your requirement for sufficient? So, yeah. If, if you're using it to discover rogue APs that, you know, come up and, and beacon routinely. Yeah. It'll eventually, it, it'll pretty quickly find them. Uh, if you're using it for like RTLS locationing with highly mobile clients, you know, maybe you do want dedicated APs for that. So it really depends on the use case. All right. Thanks a lot, Jack. And I think, Heather, we can summon Eric from the darkness. Let us see if he lurks. He does. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Eric. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Jack, awesome stuff. Really appreciate it. And uh, today, guys, it's, uh, you know, it's that time, seven minutes with seven signal, where we take a little feature inside seven signal, unpack it and show you how it could be really valuable. It's funny, Jack, you've been talking about most important, least capable, really ironic, because, you know, my wife calls me that all the time. Nevertheless, I am going to show you one of my favorite reports in Mobileye, if I may. So let's share my screen and do this. Boom. All right, so you should be able to see that. If you can, give me the thumbs up. All right. All right, so here you go, guys. This is really cool. We were talking about, once again, most important, least capable. What are the capabilities of my 
devices out there. What does my fleet look like? And Mobileye does something that's pretty remarkable in that basically we're going to snap up or snatch up every adapter driver combination out there across your fleet. And this is, and we're going to kind of rank order them according to performance. And I really like using 7MCS or MCS. 7MCS is kind of our enhanced version of MCS. Because MCS takes into account things like spatial streams and the channel width and all of that, right? Because that's important in determining if these devices are fulfilling our expectations. Are, can they be all that they can be based upon their capabilities, right? And so look at all of these different adapters and, oh my gosh, different versions of the driver, as you can see here, pretty remarkable. I can see how many clients have that configuration. I can see which ones are AX versus AC, very important. One of the things that I always like to look for is, are there any old, old versions of driver out there like this one? Okay, they're up to 22.170, by the way, if you didn't know, so this is really old. The other thing I always look for is, do I see any N adapters out there? N, 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 no. And then the other thing I look for, guys, is I look for things like this. Oh, wow, this is interesting. Is this condoned usage? Is somebody supposed to be able to put in a little USB adapter? I don't know. But you know what? I want to learn a little bit more about this. How many spatial streams does this device has? Who has a device that has this interesting little USB Wi-Fi adapter. Well, there's only one person out there. So this allows me to really zero in on the exceptions as well, right? It's funny. We think that we have like this homogeneous fleet of devices out there. Nothing could be further from the truth. My goodness. So here it is. It's an Optiplex 7080 from Dell. This is the one and only client in my entire fleet that has this configuration. I want to take a closer look and just kind of see what's going on from either a performance level and also from a device capabilities level. Okay, so of course, when I mouse over this here, it's gonna load you know, the snapshot of everything that's in the air around it, of course. You can see the signal strength and you can see the data rate and the connection type. Remember, we were talking about phi and how important it is to know because that's also gonna contribute to that important most or that important least capable equation. I want to go down here over to the left, however, and I want to see, whoa, look at this. So I have the name of the computer. If I want to check it out up close and personal, three by three coming out of this USB adapter, that's pretty impressive. And, you know, that's why I'm probably going to see some interesting data rates that I wouldn't normally see and, uh, you know, MCS rates accordingly. So there you have it, guys. I mean, when you've got this on your devices, it's just remarkable how much you can learn about your fleet. I mean, you've got thousands and thousands of devices out there. You don't know what is what and what's performing and what isn't and why. But when you can look at a report like this and you can maybe filter by location or network, now you have the knowledge in order to then determine, okay, do I need to upgrade these? Do I need to downgrade those? It's all right here in front of you. So there you have it. Happy to join you guys today. And I just wanna remind everybody out there we can't see or hear Wi-Fi, but 7Signal can. Thanks for joining us today.